Alors voilà, on va débuter. Alors, bienvenue à tous et à toutes à ce webinaire de l'Institut Tamarac, l'art de... Welcome everyone to this uh, uh, webinar, webinar by the uh, Tamarac Institute on uh, simply on navigating in the art of navigating in Torrance. Today, I'm with uh, Melissa Riva and Mathieu Niska, and I am Miriam Berube, I'm director and consultant with the Institute uh, for the Francophone Communities. Next, please. Before we start, I'd like to thank our partner, the Secretariat aux Relations Canadiennes for the Quebec government, thanks to whom we've had interpretation, simultaneous interpretation for this event. This event is a part of a five, uh, is part of a five ser uh, is a series of a five part conversation, which illustrates uh, uh, the work of the Tamaric Institute. So today we are looking at collaboration from the point of view of uh, collaboration, uh, collective leadership, as well as innovation in communities and a participative evaluation with our partnership, uh, thanks to our partnership with Secretariat aux Relations Canadiennes. Voilà, maintenant on peut commencer. So notre... that's it. Now uh, we can start our webinar. And... Uh, uh, which is based on gratitude and acknowledgement. So we'd like to acknowledge that we are uh, gathering here on uh, Indigenous people's lands, and this is in respect uh, with connections uh, of the past, present and future. And we are grateful to uh, for the opportunity to be gathered here. We'd like to thank all generations of the Indigenous peoples who take good care of these lands. As part of these lands, we're going to be discussing resilience, and I'd like to acknowledge and honor the resilience of indigenous communities both yesterday and today. Uh, calling you today from Georgia Gay, which is colonially known as Montreal, which is uh, located on the traditional uh, territory of the Ghanaian Gehaga people. And this uh, land acknowledgement today, as well as uh, is an acknowledgement of the contribution and importance of indigenous peoples. And this is part of a collective commitment to um, the process of truth and reconciliation in our communities. If there are any persons who are interested, I'd like to invite you to um, do a land acknowledgement from wherever you're calling us today. Next slide, please. So a few words about the Tamarack Institute. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, about the institution, so the Tamarack Institute is a huge network for learning. It's a learning center. Uh, for community development. And through our learning center, I told you about our five major areas of importance. We have uh, webinars, we have publications, coaching, training in order to uh, equip uh, change makers uh, at community level. We also support a major network of learners of uh, dynamic communities, cities, as well as local leaders in order to implement uh, change initiatives uh, aimed at reducing or ending poverty, uh, building links with the youth, as well as uh, ensuring a fair and equitable uh, climate transition. Next slide. Now uh, onto our panelists. Now it is a pleasure for me to introduce our different speakers. We have Mathieu and Melissa. Mathieu has been working since 2017 as a consultant in community development with NISCA. And NISCA, for those of you who don't know this organization, it is a very dynamic, vibrant uh, organization working on the movement of learning institutions on shared governance. Mathieu is equally founder of Scope Accolades in France, where he has been working since 2009. For Mathieu, his commitment is aimed at giving meaning to projects that uh, serve the collective interest with a focus, a focus towards the future. And I can assure you of that because there is innovation in the practices and ideas which are supported uh, by Mathieu all through uh, the lifespan of the projects which he's part of. Melissa, Melissa Riva is uh, Chief Executive Officer for CDC, which is the Corporation for Community uh, Development at Memphremagog, and she's been uh, holding the position for over two years. She comes to us with more than 10 years of experience in collaborative initiatives and consulting services in the community sector, and this helps us to come up with uh, community uh, com community intellig intelligence, and she'll be discussing this, or collective intelligence, and she'll be discussing more of this with us today. So welcome to you. Thank you for accepting the invitation to discuss resilience today. So resilience, we talked a lot about resilience uh, from an individual standpoint, from an organizational and community standpoint. 
it is the ability of a person's organizations to arise or to uh, move on after a after experiencing a shock and we're realizing that this is a concept that is gaining more and more importance in a context that's constantly changing and uh, our environment is more and more um, unpredictable today we will be discussing what we refer to by uh, resilient communi communities and organizations and to see how in practical terms we can embed this in our day-to-day -day activities in the lives of uh, communities and organizations I'll start by turning it to Mathieu to kick off this uh, webinar. Mathieu, I'd like to invite you to talk to us about uh, uh, experiments with the uh, Operation Resilience and uh, uh, what uh, needs were to be addressed and how did you come up with this project? So thank you very much, uh, Miriam, for inviting us. It is an honor to be here with you today. Uh, the Operation Resilience project, I think, uh, uh, came as a result of the pandemic. And during the pandemic, uh, like everyone else, uh, it was a, a key moment in our lives, which uh, uh, led us at NISCA to start asking ourselves questions around resilience. And we said, well, everyone was saying we need to be resilient. We need to, it was like a form of instruction or imperative for individuals. And we're wondering at our institution how, now individuals can be uh, resilient, but can, the organizations that we've created today, be, can they be resilient? And we were trying to focus on the organizational aspect more than the psychological aspects, even though we drew very much inspiration from what Boris Yurinik did during his work on resilience. And uh, so uh, we focused very much on organizations, working organizations, and we considered the organization as a human being. And based on this, we we came up with an idea of working with our uh, environment to try to uh, make progress on this uh, notion. And we tried to see how we could make progress in a world that is complex and sometimes uh, very uncertain and constantly changing. And in spite of that, continue making sense of our actions. This is a major challenge. And sometimes you get discouraged and you're like, well, what's happening? How do you get organized? So we tried to come up with a project with with 11 people initially. Uh, Melissa is here, she'll talk more about it. And in order to move forward on this uh, uh, project on organizational uh, resilience, which is very little, uh, uh, there's a lot, little development in the field. We talk more about individual resilience and not organizational. So we worked on the uh, protection factors of organizations. We try to see how organizations can develop protection uh, aspects in order to be able to address shocks, environmental shocks, and in a world that is becoming more and more complex. So we uh, worked on three capacities, which uh, seem uh, important for us, uh, ability to absorb the absorption capacity, capacity, how an organization can absorb shocks. And we looked at how they can it can renew itself by reimagining and reinventing itself. That's the ability to reinvent oneself. And the other ability is ownership. Now, that is about uh, taking, um, you know, taking, uh, becoming aware of what has happened and moving on and being ready for the future and to address future challenges. So in order to uh, further delve into these capacities, we uh, came up with a, a circle of um, uh, persons who uh, accepted to work with us uh, over the course of a few months to discuss the concept of uh, resilience, but also to put it in practice, uh, in practical terms, uh, to see how organizations can become resilient, uh, the same way humans develop uh, resilience. And to conclude, I, uh, I would like to mention that there's no attitude in this project, uh, which is in the sense, we're, we're not trying to be prescriptive, we're not trying to force a certain worldview on people, but we're trying to come up with uh, paradigm as far as uh, resilience is concerned. And we're trying to make it such that uh, organizational resilience is uh, really an interesting path to envisage how organizations can forge ahead today. Thank you, um, Mathieu, for setting the stage. Now I'll turn over to you, Melissa Rivard, and to ask you when this op uh, project, Operation Résilience, was launched, uh, why did you decide to join in, on, in, in this project? What was your focus? Well, from a very personal standpoint, I've been working in the community for quite some time and experience has always taught me that uh, you always need to innovate and that's how you uh, remain relevant. And uh, Matthew mentioned it is a, an environment that is constantly changing. Finance is, is difficult to get. Uh, you have projects, you have clients with changing needs. 
and uh, it is a special con uh, context to work in an environment. So you need to constantly adapt. And that is what Niska offered us through this experience, which was looking at a process and not a result, you know, an end point. I was in an adventure where we were going to adapt, uh, constantly work with collective intelligence rather than expertise uh, in order to build resilience. And this was something that I was really interested in from a personal standpoint. This was not the first time I was involving myself in such a process. This was something that I was quite uh, interested in and which I had produced uh, quite a number of uh, uh, positive results uh, previously for me. I'm working with a group of uh, organizations currently and we're trying to develop the ability uh, for our members to act. And so therefore, uh, resilience is important for a territory or community in order to better collaborate, better offer services to the community and to better be efficient in our ecosystem. And uh, I, when I worked at NISCA, I knew exactly what the modus operandum was. And uh, to me, it was a, a wonderful experience. And I decided, therefore, to um, get involved uh, with the approval of my board of directors. And uh, I think this was an enriching experience, both for me uh, personally and professionally. So uh, to join, uh, so you joined with a cohort of uh, members with varying perspectives. It was not just people uh, on the territory uh, where you were working at uh, CDC and Fremagog, but you equally collaborated with uh, different communities in the Eastern Townships, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe we should come back to uh, the project uh, per se. So what about this project made uh, Operation Resilience a resounding success? What were the, uh, f what were the different uh, uh, positive uh, outcomes of this project? So sometimes when we, people tell us about uh, organizational resilience, what is this about? We live in an uncertain world. Uh, but for me at this community center, what is what do I gain in working on such a project? What is uh, the benefit that I derived uh, in wasting, why would I waste my time uh, and my team's time uh, working on such an idea? But then we realized that today, the impact of uh, this uh, project uh, uh, comes at, uh, is, uh, at four levels. The first is at organizational culture. The first is resilience. And we talked about uh, protecting a child and uh, the more a child has uh, layers of protection from the beginning uh, in their early uh, stages of development, the more likely they are able to absorb uh, in knowledge and information around them. So uh, historically, we've looked at the different aspects of organizational culture. We've looked at what happened in the past. And sometimes uh, certain teams have an uh, uh, organizational uh, DNA, which doesn't concern them and which they which they embody in spite of themselves and so which impacts organizational culture and this affects the uh, human resources as well as uh, the wealth of talent and this uh, makes you question your place and your system of values as an individual and also affects the team dynamic this equally uh, pushes you to question governance and sometimes we talk about shared governance participative and inclusive governance uh, these are training words and people say, well, we need to change our mode of governance, but how do you go about it? By coming up with different perspectives around the three uh, capacities, which I mentioned a moment ago, this requires us to uh, make significant impact, especially in the way we make decisions. How do we uh, put uh, in place a uh, um, low impact or uh, high stake or low stake uh, uh, decision making processes? This leads organizations to reposition themselves. And the last one is a strategic positioning. A resilient organization is one which is able to um, tell you how a new strategic uh, stance can uh, uh, give rise, um, can, can come about at a certain moment in their history and development. So this takes time, it cannot be improvised, but I'll say that this is, it is not a lot of work to work on uh, uh, this at an organizational level. It is more about investing. So this is an investment which uh, organizations can no longer afford to, uh, you know, to, to ignore. And that's what's happening nowadays. Thank you very much for sharing uh, some of the uh, results of the positive impact of the uh, project on how they actually uh, brought about a transformation at different levels in across our organizations. I, th I understand that this can be challenging sometimes and difficult, but then in the long term, this uh, uh, helps us to uh, be uh, better equipped uh, to, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you, uh, Melissa, 
how is uh, resilience embedded or incorporated in your practices? Well, for us, it is a constantly changing process. And at the beginning, we talked about uh, participation in the cohort. Uh, on my part, I gave myself the mission to uh, bring back the learning and the activities in my environment environment in order to contribute to uh, resilience in the community. So by taking part in this uh, cohort, it is uh, led to a few, um, a number of things that I learned. And Mathieu mentioned it a moment ago. Sometimes we actually have certain perspective in order to better analyze our environments. Um, my attitude has changed and then we begin to normalize our different reactions and we were in a pandemic at that moment and it gave us a different uh, perspective on and uh, take on uh, how to address certain things by taking part in this uh, cohort i took part in the activities of members of my team and i took a step back and we discussed our vulnerabilities together and we discussed the uh, dna of uh, uh, cdc memfragog um I proposed to the board of directors to actually come up with a working group on resilience so that we can be able to take ownership of the different concepts and give them life within our organization. And from a very selfish standpoint, this uh, actually enabled me to play the role of facilitator. And, uh, you know, so and following this uh, different uh, parallel uh, approaches, we decided to, to table um, we had a program in order to a pilot project which uh, had a significant funding and this is a revolving uh, funding uh, project and we tabled this project on uh, the uh, day of resilience and this was a major get together bringing together over 60 uh, participants uh, at, across different sectors in our territory to uh, look uh, closely at the concept of resilience and we had to come up with common language uh, around resilience because i mean let's face it just the term actually wakes up our antibodies right we are tired of hearing people talking about resilience but we need to actually take responsibility and fully understand the extent of it and avoid having any biases and to look at it like a term that has become almost negative in uh, current times. So we wanted to create that space in order to listen to the um, opinions of our partners and to uh, listen to their experiences. There was a pandemic in our discourse, but not that much. We were focused inward on organizations, their ecosystems and the future. We equally offered our members following this uh, Resilience Day, we offered them four to six hours of support and coaching within their own organizations by uh, the uh, NISCA uh, cohort and because it's important uh, from all what I told you this had a direct impact on the lives of these organizations we try to equip them to bring back these notions within their working teams so that they should be able to sow the seeds of resilience within those, those uh, settings and I think this was one of our major successes we're still hearing about it and uh, I think everyone experiences the notion of resilience differently and we're not all at the same stages of development when it comes to resilience. So it was really better for them to experience this internally as an organization. And I think that was that was a major spin-off of uh, this uh, project. We're currently organizing the second um, Resilience Day in next April, still with NISCA, so that we can move from organizational uh, resilience to territorial or community resilience. We have over 40 people already registered for the event, and we have quite a good uh, momentum going on. And there's some people who were there and who want to uh, dig deeper into the notion of resilience. So at Memphremagog, we want to make this concept, uh, keep it alive. And this is something we're really proud of. Well, maybe we can use the opportunity to uh, show on the screen uh, the uh, graphic uh, that uh, was developed as part of this event. And I found this really extraordinary. Jamie, can we uh, project the slide, please? So you can see uh, the graphic. It's really beautiful. What was done on organizational resilience. Uh, maybe you can talk to us a bit more about how we brought uh, the notion of uh, resilience to life on a day-to-day -day basis because in the cohort where we are we are more focused on the processes the facilitators uh, reinvested the notions as well as the learnings in their environments and uh, during those days it was the members who were uh, taking uh, pushing forward with these ideas in order to make an impact on their organizational culture on human resources on collaboration and leadership as well as governance all those aspects which we uh, named earlier Maybe just tell us uh, how we uh, kept this notion alive on a day-to-day -day basis under this project. Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Melissa. Well, Mathieu, you can go ahead and then Melissa will take after you. 
Well, I just wanted to uh, raise the issue. When I look at this uh, uh, picture, you can see a uh, uh, join a, a, a bonded team. Uh, there's an issue of posture, the posture of individuals in the collective and a team that is meshed together. Do we need to see it to believe or do we believe it in order to see it? Because I think there's a number of values that are tied to uh, down to every individual. And this is something major in our approach. For us, we think that uh, systems are also influence individuals as well as influence inf uh, individuals influence the system. And uh, sometimes uh, it is up to the system to uh, act uh, to influence the individuals rather than creating uh, interpersonal tension. So we need to work on organizational tensions in a positive light and uh, understand that this tension arrives as a result of uh, events that could uh, trigger a number of issues, maybe a reduction in funding, the arrival of a new uh, competing organization in your field of expertise. There are a number of trigger points like this which can actually lead to uh, organizational resilience without you necessarily saying it explicitly, but it's important to actually explain it clearly to the members of the organization, because if it's done implicitly, this doesn't help the team members in their work and in their attitude. And uh, that way it becomes something negative, whereas resilience at uh, organizational level actually helps you to move on and to adapt to this new change in your environment. And sometimes it's difficult to explain this clearly, especially in order to guarantee success of the organization. We also look at dysfunctional aspects and sometimes we uh, try as much as we can to find mechanisms for people to bounce back. Resilience is actually, it, it's it's found in the etymolo etymology of the term. Actually, resilience uh, actually means to bounce back to bounce back systematically. And this is something that can be internalized within the teams. I really love uh, this uh, notion of making things really explicit because that is something uh, that we are not very good at within our organization. Sometimes when tension uh, arrives and this tension is not clearly explained and people don't have the tools to analyze and to understand exactly what we're experiencing and what's going on. And we had a lot of this during the pandemic and it's still going on now. That is where those uh, tensions actually exacerbate and it leads to conflict. And so uh, um, now over to you, uh, Melissa, that was my first reaction to uh, the comments from uh, Mathieu. So, well, yes, uh, to, to get to this as manager, what can I do? I think uh, you need to create space as a manager, always create space. Uh, and that's a major challenge and we'll discuss this further to always uh, save time in order to make things explicit, to learn collectively uh, about our practices, to share our strengths and our vulnerabilities. So how is this incorporated in my teamwork at CDC? On a day-to-day -day basis, we have uh, days for knowledge sharing. We always have uh, points during our team meetings where we share our strengths and our vulnerabilities and where we have calls for collaboration and action. We have space to reorient ourselves, to anticipate what's happening, to question ourselves, to uh, change perspectives, to uh, enjoy or give and receive feedback. And these are things that take up a lot of time in our agenda, but we believe this to be relevant for it to be able to make an impact. We equally pay attention to our team's agility and we also respect each other's limits. We always value everything that's flexible. We try as much as we can to uh, adapt and also to uh, respect one another and always say that, well, yes, uh, sometimes you could have different uh, opinions when you're working, but when you're working on innovation, social innovation and social development, your uh, agenda cannot you know, be fixed or written in stone from Monday to Friday because the aspects that demand a lot of in energy. And so you need to create space in order to understand the ecosystem, to join in and work collaboratively with others. This is something that I insist very much on with my teams, because sometimes you have the feeling that you should always be acting uh, in an emerging situation. You have files coming in, you need to always say yes, but believe you me, there will always be needs. And so we need to make sure that we can create those uh, collective spaces for everyone to participate. And this translates in our calls for collaboration, in our annual reports, uh, you know, we take the time to ask the right questions. And everything that we do, uh, we try actually to put in place uh, uh, processes which we bring into our coaching uh, sessions with our members or uh, support uh, initiatives. We integrate those aspects of resilience and we also see uh, graphic facilitation. And uh, we discuss all this, but of course it remains a challenge because this is a language that we're trying to build up together. And this is how we experience it on a day-to-day -day basis. We try to make it a point of duty 
and uh, we build resilience. As you can see, it's all small, but for us, it's a huge, deal. it's a big deal. Each time you come to our office, everyone who works with us, it's something that becomes very apparent because we've made it, uh, we've enshrined it in our work uh, uh, principles and uh, practices and even our vision. I'd like to just add, uh, based on what Melissa has mentioned, I'd like to add that we believe that we need to uh, create a, a profound time, which is not a linear time, which is not cyclical time, but which is in-depth time. And we all need to take time uh, for ourselves. We need to create that time. It's all a, master, a matter of a, a perspective. And, you know, when someone tells you today that they have time, they, they are looked upon like someone who's abnormal, who's idle, or who is not, you know, doing their work, right? But we need to make space, create time in order to slow things down, like to slow down that linear movement in time and also stop working frantically without actually thinking about uh, what we're doing. And uh, in-depth time uh, is something, uh, it, it's almost like sleep, right? It, you know, when you're plunged into a deep, uh, state of deep sleep. So yes, it is this learning, right? And it is uh, it helps you regenerate and recharge, right? Yes, thank you so much. Maybe we can take out take off the uh, the uh, graphic uh, on the slide. It is really beautiful and uh, and it's really interesting uh, how it uh, gives you some of those light bulb uh, moments, uh, which uh, inspire teams and groups uh, to work together. Each of you actually mentioned in your different. Uh, um, contributions, you talked about challenges. So I'd like us to discuss this further. What are some of the challenges that you can actually experience when you uh, make a move to uh, build a uh, collective and organizational um, resilience? Who wants to start? Melissa, you can go ahead. Well, of course, it uh, creates a lot of uh, um, discomfort. And uh, here, because when you talk about the notion of resilience, sometimes people are uh, are uh, so comfortable. Others are very uncomfortable when it comes to the micro level. Others are very comfortable at mic macro level. So it's kind of uncomfortable to navigate uh, in those torrents, but you need to learn to be comfortable in uh, discomfort. Uh, I think also making all of this very practical was a major challenge. And I'll say that on our territory, in our community, we came up with a resilient approach and at some point everyone else was fed up with the term resilience so what we did was to deconstruct and reconstruct our resilience uh, according to our own image and when i talk about taking time uh, taking the time we uh, work in an organization where we assist people we develop things and maybe it's easier for us to create time right but when you work in an organization where there are emergencies on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, you need to uh, report, you need to uh, seek source funding, you need to uh, address your personal issues. In fact, it, it, you know, sometimes taking a step back is, it really um, uh, requires a lot of audacity and a lot of conviction. So this was a major challenge uh, working on this project. Matthew, do you want to continue? Uh, well, talking about uh, being uncomfortable, and uh, I would like to tell you that uh, we uh, felt that discomfort and and uh, when assisting the, uh, people in this approach, I'd say that uh, with regard to Jean-Marie's uh, question, um, our major challenge, the major challenge that we have today is how do we move from our personal uh, capacity and understanding of uh, personal resilience and individual resilience? How do we work and transpose that into organizations? Because we are still at the first step of individual resilience because many people wanted to go and work uh, in the community with other stakeholders, but they were not themselves uh, uh, very comfortable with certain notions. So I think uh, regenerating and going and seeking out territorial aspects in order to work into an organization. And also the fact that you go and seek out those territorial aspects actually have a mirror effect on the organization. The territory has a territorial resilience, community resilience, as well as organizational resilience and individual resilience. But I believe personally that organizational resilience is the main object and acts on the individual aspect as well as the territorial and community aspects. So if a community center doesn't feel comfortable and doesn't understand why that is the case, it becomes difficult for them, uh, especially if we consider that an organization is an individual, it'd be difficult for them to look, to uh, sit down with their peers or with uh, the uh, collaborators and clients if the organization is not aligned with itself, uh, itself and, the, and the individuals working with them, it becomes a bit 
paradoxical and actually requires you to delve into the history of the construction of different territories and environmental settings. Oh, wow. So you've touched on uh, main, uh, many challenge de challenges there, which are not only limited to creating time in your workday, it is also about a complete change of perspective that you're sharing here with us. So inversely, I'm interested in finding out what were some of the ingredients um, that would allow people to uh, build their capacities in order to create or uh, develop a resilient community. Because of course, we would we've been talking about organizations, we can continue in that uh, light, but what are the key ingredients to, uh, you know, being able to build one's capacity in terms of uh, resilience? Uh, do you want to try that question, Melissa? Well, I'd say uh, it takes a lot of uh, uh, gut, it takes um, a lot of courage and uh, in order to uh, make impact at territory, territorial and organizational level, don't be afraid to change our practices, be visionaries. Uh, that is one of the keys to success in terms of resilience. You should also uh, be an embodiment of credibility because it's important in this uh, uh, on this track, you need to uh, embody these concepts which you're trying to push forward. So we should be constant and coherent in your approach. Don't be scared to uh, expose your weaknesses and vulnerabilities or mistakes or common perspectives or differences as well, uh, which is when we're talking about making things explicit, it's not always a comfortable process, uh, but when you commit to that process, there's a lot that can come out and uh, can actually help others to be uh, a get uh, on board. And I think this is an important aspect to building our capacity and also accepting that you don't have to be an expert in the field in order to embark on the journey of resistance resilience for your organization or to start uh, implementing a certain practical aspects of resilience. I actually work from that, uh, uh, from that uh, particular uh, position and uh, bear in mind that we can try things, we can learn from our mistakes, we can make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. And that is how resilience is built uh, thanks to those uh, different concepts which were mentioned by Mathieu to practice, to highlight things, to try a number of things, make mistakes and then bounce back. To me, those are ingredients which help you in the process and lead uh, ultimately to building a resilient community. Oh yes, it's very important to highlight that ability to learn and also the ability to allow yourself to make mistakes uh, during the process. Uh, to um, That is something that you looked at uh, during uh, your work with the cohort and in the community and to approach things with a lot of humility and to understand that you don't have all the answers and it's okay, you don't have to have all the answers. It is collectively that we are able to work things out and to find the right path forward. So. Um, that is uh, the uh, learning approach, which uh, in my view is uh, an important uh, aspect. So yeah, I think uh, there were already a number of ingredients in the question and then we have uh, the ingredients and then uh, the recipe is there. And of course it's more complex to uh, get to the recipe, but you know, uh, you try as much as you can to reinvest what you learn and what you observe in your environment in order to improve and transform your practices. I think uh, I'll turn it over to Mathieu on this uh, question of ingredients as well. Well, yeah. I think uh, Melissa gave uh, a complete answer, but I'd just like to add that uh, engaging in authentic co collaboration, uh, collaboration could actually be one way of working in certain uh, settings that could appear to be superficial. And uh, in a resilience process, it is important to be authentic in how you approach collaboration. And in collaboration, there's the, there's the understanding that you work together. It starts with being vulnerable. Um, it also starts with a number of uh, iterations of what, how you feel. It also comes with uh, organizational chaos. And uh, it's different. It's a different phases. And we actually experienced different phases with the group. And there were moments when personally we felt like we had uh, embarked on something that didn't make sense. And some people were fed up at some point in the process. But I think there's a necessity, there's that importance for people to uh, really uh, you know, feel vulnerable and to be sincere in the approach for things to work. And we need to also uh, provide the necessary tools. Uh, there were a number of tools that we actually uh, put in place in order to uh, make sure that uh, we uh, remain focused on our objective and uh, remain relevant. I see that Jamie has shared uh, something in the uh, chat. Uh, there's a uh, 
a very beautiful compendium that uh, Niska uh, developed on resilience. For those of you who would like to know more about uh, the notion of uh, resilience, I'd like to actually invite you to look at this compendium, which actually helps you to clearly position the different capacities that were built as part of this project and how they were implemented across different territories. We also shared another resource, which is a free guide on uh, sustainability and resilience. So uh, the resilience of collaborative uh, in, uh, initiatives, which was published by Tamarack Institute recently. I think uh, my colleague just shared that in the chat. So if that's okay with you, I'd like to invite our participants to uh, raise their questions. And for you to do that, you can e either use the chat or you can ask your question and you can ask your question in the language of your choice, be it in English or French, we will use simultaneous interpretation for these purposes. So a moment ago, I saw Jean-Marie in the chat who uh, was uh, asking questions about external challenges in the community, uh, challenges both uh, mainly on the societal uh, aspect. I think Mathieu, you partly addressed the uh, question. So I'll like to bring us back to uh, the question while we're waiting for our participants to also maybe share their experience or maybe ask their questions in the chat. Maybe you have uh, experience in terms of resilience that you'd like to share with us. So please feel free to do so. So are those factors, so how do you uh, move from uh, organizational resilience and merge it into territorial resilience? I know that this is the topic of the second day at uh, CDC Mem Fremagog. But uh, what is this about? There are many external factors that can actually um, have an incidence on a resilience on a larger scale, uh, as in the case of a community, a territory, or uh, what uh, Jean-Marie uh, talked about uh, at society, a societal level. So how do we make progress on that? Well, from our perspective, I can tell you about an initiative which we put in place in the fall. Uh, there was a uh, uh, project, a uh, um, housing project, which uh, we uh, came up with. We know that it was not the community uh, initiative that we're going to resolve the issue, but with uh, multi-sector uh, stakeholders, but we uh, we authentic, we were audacious, bold, and we asked the right questions. And we had a number of uh, stakeholders that were not very agile in that particular space. And we were able to come up with an initiative which could ultimately address our needs on the uh, territory. And that is how we came up with this project on uh, housing, which which is uh, a project that is a uh, uh, project in its own right with uh, specific, more or less specific objectives and uh, is uh, has an, uh, a theory of change, but which brought together stakeholders who were not necessarily working together previously. So internally, our ways of working and the different concepts that we try to embody, we opened the circle um, uh, to a challenge that uh, affected everyone else. And that is how the movement uh, actually uh, happened. Uh, we transitioned, it was not a perfect move, but uh, one of the keys to success was to have a stakeholder who's a visionary, uh, who knows how to mobilize their troops. And uh, we talk about the fact that moving this project to a territorial level, we need to have a leader with a vision to lead us and who is reassuring and who can also be focused on the process rather than the end result, because uh, otherwise uh, it would be, um, it would, the, the project would probably die in its early stages. Yeah, you're right. Of course, uh, when there's no organization or individual to uh, push forward with an uh, with a project and uh, to work on uh, challenges that are as complex as uh, the uh, challenges of housing, which you mentioned. Do you want to add something else, Matthew? You want to chime in? Well, on uh, territorial resilience, I'd like to say that it is the step that comes afterwards. I don't have a lot of clarity on that, but. Um, I looked at everything that was written on territorial resilience. I have the feeling that it's more uh, with uh, the issue of uh, biodiversity, which is all good. I unfortunately can't give a concrete example on that aspect directly. Thank you, it's all good. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next question. Well, now, what are the different uh, aspects to explore in order to uh, gauge the level of resilience of an organization or territory? Well, uh, as far as that is concerned, I'd say, well, in, from my experience, it is the art of asking the right questions and taking the right decisions. And I think that this allows you to be able to truly gauge uh, in the past, present and future, the way 
in which uh, the way in which you ask questions uh, sometimes actually uh, sometimes it's often said that the art of questioning uh, asking a question can actually lead you to a change of paradigm and actually lead an organization on a fresh path and uh, build a new pathways to resilience that is how i address the question that's the art of asking the right questions and taking the right decisions i think that's it it's actually an art and uh, to add to that, I'll talk of the art of prioritizing, uh, you know, time, taking time, because when you're working and you uh, move from one, switch from one concept to the other and life is a fast moving lane and uh, you don't find time, uh, you don't take time to take a step back, I think uh, we need to be able to facilitate uh, in-depth questions and that's how you get to asking the right questions and we did this during the fall and we're able to you know reset over a month and a half we saw the negative as, uh, impact that it could have had on our work and there's another indicator which in my view can uh, help you assess a resilient uh, community it is its ability to prioritize those spaces irrespective of what's happening within the organization or on your territory Oh, thank you very much. These are really uh, good, uh, you know, uh, nuggets uh, for uh, brainstorming. And I don't know if uh, the Timeric Institute will be able to develop a tool uh, to help us uh, get more insight into uh, resilience indicators. I'd like to look at a uh, comment of Elizabeth, who says she's worked for a number of years on um, territorial uh, resilience, which was embedded in the culture of the organization. However, among some of the uh, Founders, as well as uh, board of directors, resilience became uh, a major excuse. And each time they would discuss uh, humanitarian and uh, safety issues, as well as health issues, uh, the question is to how do you uh, put a limit to uh, people who actually use uh, resilience as an excuse to limit the impact that you can actually have when uh, you're faced with challenges? Well, yeah, the, the comments of Elizabeth are really relevant. And today, that is what I find really interesting with regard to resilience when it comes to uh, politics and ideology. Um, because when you look at what's happening today and what we read on Haiti, uh, Haiti is a really uh, good example without going into too much details. There's a challenge um, as a society because I think uh, if individuals are resilient, then they will cost, uh, they'll be less costly for society because there'll be less uh, concerns. I think uh, you need to be uh, resilient. If you're not resilient, it means that you're not able to rise after uh, disappointment or after a negative event in life. I think uh, resilience is something really relevant in that society. And there's a philosopher who is uh, Laura Moiti, who uh, is uh, in controversy with uh, other philosophers on this issue, who said, not all of us can be resilient. We're not all equal, as well as all organizations cannot be resilient, right? So, in any case, people would say, well, they, they will be resilient as if it was an obligation to be resilient. So I think we should be very cautious and be very humble when we approach the notion of resilience. And this could actually be, uh, you know, taken over by politicians and uh, maybe even uh, become an ideology. And I think we need to be cautious how we approach uh, the notion of uh, resilience and avoid finding ourselves in a situation where uh, people would uh, start saying, well, if you're not resilient, then you're not, or you're not worthy, you're, you're not you're worthless, or you have no value for society. So which is why we're talking about protection factors rather than vulnerability flag factors. And fact uh, protection factors are important for individuals. And um, organizations because organizations will help you to uh, gain consciousness of a certain number of things and this can help reduce the burden uh, on the uh, shoulders of organizations so yes uh, actually empowering people in order that they can be able to carry on so and also uh, con contribute uh, to uh, being resilient when uh, shocks arrive as well as um, I think this is really interesting to uh, because we discuss this in a guide as well. These are aspects that can contribute to help help us measure or gauge the resilience levels of a community, as we mentioned earlier. I think for now you cannot uh, turn on your microphones uh, in the uh, webinar, but I think uh, my colleague is saying that uh, Valérie uh, has uh, wants to take the floor. So, uh, Jamie, can you just turn on uh, Valérie's uh, microphone so she can ask her question, please? Valérie, over to you. Well, Valérie has raised her hand, but I don't think she, I don't think she wants to take the floor. Actually, well, okay then. Well, uh, 
feel free if you're more comfortable writing uh, your comments or typing your uh, questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, switch on the cameras or microphones easily in webinar mode. I'd like to add, uh, um, when we're talking earlier on the question which was raised uh, at organizational level, sometimes we have this model uh, that uh, resilience is doing everything at the same pace uh, with less resources. That is the notion that some people often have in mind that are working at the same pace in the same way and in different contexts and that we're resilient and we shouldn't give up. But um, it is also about letting certain ideas just die and sometimes just slowing down the pace and re-looking, re-examining our mode of work. And it's not about uh, always having the same productivity levels. And for me, that was a major moment in time, stopping, taking time and looking at how we do, thing, do things and saying, well, these uh, particular activity takes up a lot of energy and then letting it go because it's a failure and it's okay to then be able to move on uh, differently. And uh, uh, that way you are not uh, in dissonance with your organization, but rather resonating with your territory. And then you become a different uh, being altogether. This was a concept that I used to associate very much to performance uh, in spite of the fact that uh, we didn't have uh, the necessary resources. Yeah, very, very, uh, very, very interesting. And Valérie, I'd like to come back to Valérie, who was wondering what are the protection factors of an organization as we we're discussing earlier on. Can we talk more about this? The protection factors for organizations are actually very different uh, from um, depending on the organization, but we find many protection factors. From what I looked at, uh, there's organizational culture, for instance, the uh, rituals, the ways of doing things within organizations. So the protection factors are actually um, um, intricately linked with uh, uh, how things happen within our organization. So you take stock of what's happening in an organization and uh, look at what makes the organization fragile and look at the uh, different protection factors and you capitalize on what protects the organization because that is what would shield it in the event of shocks and also protect the individuals working for the organization. So uh, this is a systemic thought but which allows us to be able to see, well, for instance, uh, one protection factor would be, I talked uh, about decision making earlier on. For me, decision making is a protection factor. And if we decide, for instance, in terms of impact to say, well, all our decisions will be uh, consensual decisions and we're not taking any other decision by vote because we feel like it makes our, it exposes our organization. At that point in time, you put in place a protection factor because you realize that uh, decision making by votes uh, was actually making the organization vulnerable. So now consensual or unanimous decision making could be a new way of uh, uh, moving, forging ahead. And we've said that that is an important factor. It becomes a protection factor for your organization. We can take the example of uh, maybe uh, practices and uh, human resources uh, assessments uh, for individuals what they are to know whether they do their work well to look at how we assess performance uh, the performance of individuals versus looking at the performance of the organization for me the protection the protection factor would be to assess uh, organizational performance rather than individual performance and of course i'm not saying this uh, from a neutral standpoint I am very oriented in how I uh, discussed this and we've exper experimented this at NISCA. We assessed organizational performance and the uh, model in terms of human resources is more valuable than assessing individuals. It remains a point of view, but uh, of course, uh, it was about uh, taking out uh, human resources policies because uh, the way they are drafted, human resource uh, resources policies are normally supposed to be a protection factor, but very often they turn into vulnerability factors because they are not respected down the line. So sometimes it's useless, not really relevant. But once more, it depends on the organization. I'm just giving examples um, and looking at the strategic positioning. You could have a positioning, uh, as Melissa mentioned, at high level, we could decide, for instance, uh, to... Uh, do more with less and uh, make strategic choices. And when you do that, you actually shield your organization from external shocks and uh, you do not tell the humans working in the organization to always do more with less. Uh, at that point uh, in time, the organization begins to expose itself to external shocks. 
wow, really uh, very relevant examples which have equally experienced uh, recently in communities as well as organizations that decided to say no to uh, certain types of funding uh, for some projects because this does not allow them to be able to consolidate the organization. It just uh, keeps uh, piling up uh, layers upon layers of work. And this is a lot for an organization that is short on means uh, working in the community to actually uh, give up on a certain funding, uh, certain uh, funding streams uh, for certain projects because they are overworked and want to recenter their focus on their priorities. So uh, we have a major, many, many examples of this nature, which uh, uh, bring you to uh, re-question, to question your performance parameters and uh, to uh, work differently from uh, the ways in which we are used to usually working. Yes, Mathieu? So just to take uh, buttress your point even further, a manager who actually uh, seizes all the funding opportunities around him at one point he would actually commit a management error and he would be uh, you know he would be condemned for making that mistake for being a poor manager whereas he had actually amassed more than he could actually work on and um and that is how people end up with burnouts and are less uh, motivated to do their work. And then you end up with a major challenge. Uh, and it, it, it becomes a vulnerability factor rather than an organizational um, um, uh, factor. So yes, this uh, actually um, completely meshes in with what you've said uh, earlier on. And maybe this calls for intergenerational change uh, within our organizations, uh, on organizations, uh, especially with the uh, level of turnover that we're experiencing. And we're beginning to see how important it is, uh, it is to create those spaces, to create time, um, to create those uh, in-depth moments, um, as uh, Melissa mentioned earlier on. And uh, uh, Mathieu as well, to transform our work culture and to work differently um, as far as uh, uh, the different aspects that uh, drive us nowadays are concerned, like equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, so that in internally uh, we uh, can be able to be more flexible and adapt to change so that we can equally be able to create the necessary conditions to inspire trust within the teams as well as within the communities that we serve. So as far as I'm concerned, it is about building trust internally and creating the necessary working conditions for people to want to work and to want to stay and which will enable us collectively to be able to uh, survive um, during crisis and during, uh, when, when another crisis comes around. And of course, there'll be more crisis, there'll be more events that would happen, not necessarily negative events. And it's not always negative events that actually steer organizations on a fresh path. Sometimes people always feel like uh, something negative must necessarily happen to expose an organization, but it isn't always the case. So yeah, we can actually find opportunities in uh, uh, different uh, um, uh, events and this enables organizations to be able to seize opportunities during difficult uh, situations like the number of learnings that we uh, drew from the uh, pandemic in order to improve our systems i can see that we are running short on time on time and um, unless uh, there are any more questions in the chat i see there's a comment on equity which i'll take uh, time to read and i'll give you i'll turn it over to one uh, each of you to address uh, uh, to address the comment and maybe give us a closing remark. So Jimmy says uh, uh, that uh, equity is a key aspect in the discussion on resilience. And uh, resilience is something that we take for granted, but which requires uh, that we uh, build it and reinforce it. And yes, you're right that we need to put uh, equity at the, at the heart of uh, resilience building. I don't know if you have a comment on that, any of you. Go ahead, Melissa. I think it's so well put. It's so nicely uh, framed and to... Um, conclude, uh, I'd like to just uh, thank you for the opportunity and to say, well, dive into this, uh, read our guide, um, learn more about it, practice this, because I think it's worthwhile. Uh, these are notions that are really are very practical. You can try them. And I think uh, we owe it to ourselves to learn more about resilience and to try as much as we can to, you know, uh, update it to take ownership of resilience in our own way because i think there are many good things in there i hope that i was able to inspire you to want to pursue uh, organizational resilience thank you mathieu well i'll just like to say that uh, uh, the guide is there you can uh, collect all the necessary information the project was funded by the sharion foundation and you have access to information uh free of charge and uh, in addition to that you have the possibility of uh, even 
uh, reaching out to us because uh, I think the foundation equally provided us with support to uh, pursue other initiatives. So if you're interested, please do not hesitate. And uh, we want to contribute to something really uh, great, but in a humble and modest manner and uh, bring our modest con contribution and to do our possible best. So this guide is really there for that reason, for that purpose. And uh, if you go to the website, you have the uh, short version and you have uh, a more complete version. And um, please uh, go ahead, explore, discover uh, the issue of uh, in-depth uh, time, or uh, I think this is, you would not regret uh, your time. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Matthew and Melissa. It was a pleasure to hear you and to explore these notions of resilience with you. I see that my colleague, uh, Jamie, has shared the link to the guide once more. So uh, um, do not hesitate to contact, reach out to our panelists if you have further questions and also join us during our next uh, NISCLA cohort. Jamie, I'll uh, invite you to share your screen once more. I'll make a few announcements to conclude. So, uh, and the issue of resilience, if you're interested in uh, um, you know, knowing more about resilience, we have another webinar which will be held in English with simultaneous interpretation into French on March 29th at uh, 12 p.m. to uh, build a collaborative initiative which is based on sustainability. So we'll be looking at uh, sustainability a bit more and uh, uh, resilience, both concepts are actually in inextricably linked. Uh, so we'll have a number of colleagues uh, discussing the issue and on April 26th in French with uh, English interpretation. Uh, the Saint Rock organization, uh, Agrona Saint Rock, will be uh, explaining to us when expertise and experience, citizen uh, experience and expertise, are at the core of uh, community uh, actions. So we will find ourselves around a community table to discuss the actions of citizens and uh, discuss uh, their actions as well as their expertise right up to the assessment of uh, the different initiatives we embark on. And we invite you to join in on these two uh, webinars. So to conclude, I'd like to thank Jamie for your technical assistance. Thank you everyone uh, for your questions and comments, for your uh, attention. And Melissa, Mathieu, I wish you all the best uh, for next steps and uh, thank you for uh, assisting the next cohorts and uh, thank you also for your future work on the next uh, uh, next uh, webinar and we hope to uh, learn more from your experience thank you so much